Um, very nice to be here this evening. Um, as Professor Ty said, my talk is the Rotterdam Rules, the Good, the Bad and the Ugly. But I've, I've, what I've done is I've looked at different aspects of the rules and I've made a personal decision as to whether to characterise them as the good, the bad and the ugly. Because I wanted to try, rather than just giving you a description of the Rotterdam Rules, wanted to try to give you some sort of judgment as to what aspects I think are good and, and what are not so good. Because inevitably in any treaty there are going to be aspects that are better than others. It is a compromise. Okay, what are the Rotterdam Rules? Well, their official and rather lengthy name is the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Carriage of Goods, Wholly or Partly by Sea. So, very much like the Hague, Hague, Visby and um, Hamburg rules, they cover international carriage of goods by sea. What is different are the words wholly or partly. So it's going to be clear immediately to you that the scope of the Rotterdam rules is broader than just the sea carriage of goods. It extends on either side. Those little three words, wholly or partly, were highly controversial. They were in square brackets for most of the negotiations, which took over 10 years, because the scope of the Rotterdam Rules was highly controversial. Um, the Rotterdam Rules attempt, as the Hague, Hague, Visby and Hamburg Rules did before them, to provide uniform rules on carrier liability. But again, you'll see immediately, this is where the Rotterdam rules are different. <coughs> they not only seek to prescribe carrier liability, but also they regulate shipper liability. So that's the first big difference. And then they also extend to other parties in the logistic chain. So that again is an immediate hint that they're going to be rather different from the previous conventions. So the aim of the drafters was to replace and update the Hague, Hague, Visby and Hamburg rules, as well as hybrid regimes, I'll talk in a second about what I mean by that, and to try and reunify international maritime law. The concern is that there are at least three different carriage regimes operating, the Hague, Hague, Visby and Hamburg, and then there are all of these different hybrid systems as well. So the hope is that the Rotterdam rules might actually bring it down to one system again. We'll see how successful that's going to be. Okay, so the rules themselves were approved by the United Nations General Assembly on the 11th of December 2008. If you want the official text of the rules, that's available on the UN website. A stands for assembly, res is the resolution, and the official number is 63122. So if you search for that on the website, you'll find the official text. The signing ceremony was held the following year in 2009. And so you will see that some commentators refer to the Rotterdam Rules 2009, which is strictly speaking incorrect. Um, the instrument itself ref, ref, sort of came into, into being in, at the end of 2008. Why on earth do we need more rules, given that we've already got three sets of rules? Well, the general feeling was that the Hague and Hague Visby rules were very outdated. I mean, Hague is 1924, for goodness sake. Visby's in the 1960s, but even since you know, then we've had containerization, we've had a great deal of technological developments, we now have electronic bills of lading. Hamburg rules, more modern, 1970s, but have proved very unpopular. Although the Hamburg rules are in effect, they are not adopted by any major maritime jurisdictions, and there's no suggestion that they will be any time soon. So the feeling was that really there was time for there to be a reform. And the question was whether Hague Visby should be updated again or whether something more was needed. The other thing which gave the drafting some impetus is that several countries dissatisfied with the Hague Visby and the Hamburg rules started doing a bit of DIY. 
by what I mean is they cobbled together their own maritime codes based on elements of the Hague Visby and Hamburg rules. So for example, Australia took the Hague Visby rules and broadened them out a little bit. Scandinavia went off on a frolic of their own and produced their own maritime code. Uh, mainland China has a code that takes elements from Hague Visby and Hamburg and South Korea a similar blending. So the feeling was that it was all starting to unravel a bit at the edges. And then in the early 1990s, the United States came on the picture. The United States still uses the Hague rules, and they're not even a, a party to the Hague rules, but their COGSA, their COGSA, Carriage of Goods by Sea Act in the United States, is based still on the 1924 Hague rules. So the United States is, is well overdue for reform. And in 1991, from memory, the US Senate produced a new COGSA bill, which was quite different from anything we'd seen before. The main and concerning difference was that COGSA said that it would apply to all carriage in and out of the United States, as well as inland domestic carriage on the other side. So in other words, the idea was that COGSA would apply in foreign countries. The United States intended to go it alone, unilaterally, and it was seen as a fairly aggressive move on the United States' part. So that spurred the international community into thinking, well, we really need to do something to stop this unilateral COGSA, because then everyone else is just going to go their own way. And so the CMI, the Comité Maritime International, or the International Maritime Committee, you may remember them, they drafted the Hague and the hague Visby rules. They started looking at a new convention. Uh, fairly soon, though, they decided to give it to the United Nations so that it would have a, a completely international flavour to it. And they picked UNCITRAL, the United Nations Committee on International Trade Law, to draft it for them. And the reason they did that is UNCITRAL is seen as a neutral body, quite a technical body. It deals with a lot of commercial, international commercial law, but it's not a particularly political body. The Hamburg Rules, on the other hand, were promoted by UNCTAD. UNCTAD is the United Nations Committee on Trade and Development. And there the focus is very much on empowering developing countries. And you see that coming through in the ideology underpinning the Hamburg Rules. So the feeling was that if this was a joint CMI UNCTRAL initiative, it would be less controversial. It would be far more politically acceptable to both developed and developing countries. Uh, whether that, that turns out to be true remains, I think, to be seen. Okay, so where have we got to with the Rotterdam Rules? Where is it at now? As of just the other day, when I checked on the website, 24 countries have signed up. There are some important maritime jurisdictions there. It's not just Burkina Faso and Botswana. Um, we also have Denmark, France, Greece, the Netherlands, Nigeria, very important um, African maritime jurisdiction, Norway, Spain, and the US, probably the largest player. But signing is one thing, ratification is another. To actually become a party to the rules, countries have to take that first step of ratification. And so far, only one country is ratified, and that is Spain at the beginning of this year. And this, it hasn't started a deluge of new ratifications. The Rotterdam rules will only come into force a year after 20 countries ratify.